Hi, and welcome to Talk Straight Bible. I'm your host, Jeremiah Santanetti. Uh, I'm here today uh, in the sense of without my wife because she's doing other things this morning which are also important. But please pray for her because she's always doing what she can to do the will of God. God bless her. And um, so I'm here this morning, I say by myself, and I feel kind of strange because she's been with me teaching and it's uh, it's wonderful. But here, I want to share with you a message which has been in my heart. Um, and the Lord showed me this message a while back. Uh, I was going through something very, very deep within my own heart. And I had shared that with you about what God revealed in my heart. Another level of deception, another level of sin that I have not encountered before. And you may say, well, you know, why does God do that? Because he wants us to grow. He wants us to grow. And how do we grow except that we get closer to the light? And I'm talking about the light of Scripture. The Bible tells us that in your light we shall see light. Well, when we look into the Scriptures, God will always give us a blessing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So today I want to start <clears throat> in the book of Numbers and the title today is Graves of Lust, Graves of Lust. Now, this is not something that I made up. It's in the Bible. And uh, we're going to look at this and see what God has to say about Graves of Lust. And Numbers chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 1. And the people were evil as those complaining in the ears of the Lord. And Jehovah heard, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and deviled and devo excuse me and, devo and devoured them or devoured in the most parts of the camp. So there was fire in the camp because God was angry with the people and the people cried to Moses. And when Moses prayed to Jehovah, the fire was put out. Thank God for godly intercessors who know that in the midst of God's judgment, there is mercy and they know how to touch God's heart with their words. However, it may not turn away God's judgment completely. We may have to go through some things. And um, when you look at this verse of Scripture, there is something that's going to happen here, and we need to pay attention. Verse 3 says, And he called the name of that place Tabara because the fire of Jehovah burned among them. So understand that this happened because of a mixed multitude that was within the, the children of God that came out of Egypt. <clears throat> That's right. There are people who come out of Egypt, and they were not truly sanctified. They were not really given wholeheartedly to the Lord like the Israelites, and it was this mixed multitude. The Bible says in verse 4, the mixed multitude in their midst lusted, with great lust. And the sons of Israel also turned and wept and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? The influence of their lust, their concupiscence, their lasciviousness was strong, so strong that it began to influence those that were God's people. You know, you got to be careful. And I do see this within many churches today. And remember, remember that what happened here is happening today. It has not stopped. It will continue to go on. What we've learned from history, as my wife and I always talk, is that we've learned nothing from history because we're always repeating the same sins all over and over again. Why should the enemy change his strategies if they work all the time? It works. It's we. We have to learn the strategy so that we do not fall into the temptation of great lust, especially when there are people within the church who don't really have a true intention of seeking God. And as soon as their lust rises up within them, they will begin to speak against God in such a way that you probably won't even know it pleading for something that sounds good and looks good, but in the midst of it, God gets angry when his people 
listen to the words of lust. Now, I had shared with you that I went through a time and still going through with what God has shown me and has it has, a, it has awakened in me a, a desire to know God more and to want to be pure. That's my, that's my whole concept in life, the Christian life. I, I just, my desires, I just want to be pure. My, script, my, my, most, my most favorite scripture is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I mentioned it before, and I'll say it this morning. I said, again, I'll say that I told my wife, if I go before you, I want you to put on my tombstone that verse of Scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Don't even worry about putting my name on it. I just want when people pass by, they read that. And perhaps that will convict them because the Word of God is alive. And these people rose up with, with a great multitude that had lust in their hearts and I remember the Lord showed me my own lust and I know when people think about lust immediately they think about sex that's not <clears throat> that's not what lust is all about <clears throat> lust is a perverted desire to have that which God doesn't want you to have and many times we go into the world with that desire not even realizing that is going to bring harm. And the Bible tells us that these people who had a great lust began to influence Israel. And it says in verse 5, we remember the fish. Notice what the lust was about. It didn't say anything here about sex. We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. First, I want to let you know that God let this verse of Scripture be here to teach us how we should eat. This is good stuff. I mean, fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlic. I eat this, apart from the fish. But yeah, I eat this. I, I, I really enjoy this food because it's also good for my body. And so, were they crying out for something bad? Well, no, they, they, they wanted to have good food, but they were in the desert. But they didn't trust God. See, the lust for the things of Egypt began to rise up in them. They remembered. Folks, be careful with people in the midst of your life who remembers more the former life, the things of the flesh, the things that they used to do. I've run into brothers who talk about their past life and they, it's like glorified. And sometimes you got to be careful because when they talk about it, you want to talk about it. And you start saying, I remember when I used to do this, 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 and this. Be very careful that you begin to speak about the things we did in Egypt, which you did in Egypt, which, which really um, inspires lust. I know because in the past, we talk about that, how evil we were. It's like, let me tell you, you're evil. Listen, listen to how, I, how evil I was. And you start to think about it. And before you know it, your eyes are filled with the past. And you, and you find yourself glorifying the past rather than glorifying God. We remember what we ate when we were in the world. We remember the things that we did. And this is a lust from the soul, the darkness of the soul. And this is what God began to show me a long time ago. Well, not too long ago, but a while back. And I, my heart was broken. I, I, was, I was just broken at the axe in my heart. And I, I, I wept. Oh, my God. I, I said, God, please have mercy on me. I don't think I've ever asked God for grace and mercy like that ever in my Christian walk. But I wanted him to be merciful to me. And I feel his Holy Spirit even here right now just touching me and reminding me of his goodness and his mercy. And it's just a marvelous thing when we look to God and we start to talk about not the lust of our flesh, but the things that he has done for us. And look what they say in verse 6, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. <laughs> Here, they saw bread come down from heaven. They ate the angel's food. They, they, they experienced the power of God in the desert they have food every day but that wasn't enough anymore it became so common that they said oh who wants to eat this manner oh the bread of heaven 
The bread of heaven came down freely and they were able to eat and they were filled and it was good bread. It was bread to keep them healthy and God gave them water and God gave them everything that they needed at this point before he took them into the promised land. Just hold on a little longer. Don't move. Don't go so fast. Stop chasing after the waterfalls. A song came out a few years ago. Don't chase after anyone's waterfalls because you're going to see that you're going too fast and you're going to destroy yourself. Oh my God, when we are not satisfied with Him, when we are not satisfied with Him, we will run after the waterfalls of this world. We will begin to complain and, and say, but our souls are dried away and there's nothing besides just manna. Imagine that. They came out of Egypt. Their souls should have been filled with the goodness of God's love as he should be with his mercy and his grace and the testimony of what he has given them by bringing them out. They should have been so grateful. Are you grateful this morning? Do you say, God, thank you so much for taking me out of the pus out of the out of the lust, out of the, the the manure that we were in, that I was in, that I was doing all these things, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for delivering me. Verse eight, and the people went around and gathered and ground in mills and beat in the mortar and baked in pans and made cakes of it and tasted it. It was like fresh, and they taste, and it, and it would, excuse me, uh, they taste of it. It was like the taste of fresh oil. Man, they began to do their own thing. We ain't got to worry about eating this manna no more. And then it says, and when the dew fell upon the camp at night, the manna fell upon it. And it says this, watch this. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said to, the, to Jehovah, Why have you afflicted your servant? Oh, man. Oh, man, look at this. The man of God, right? That's why you got to be careful no matter how high you go, no matter how much God shows you, no matter how much God teaches you, no matter how God inspires you and gives you revelation, be very careful that you turn into this complaining person yourself you got people like that and let me tell you something when leaders begin to complain like this because they see people afflicted the first thing is lord why you have afflicted me with this and you know what will happen after that a desire to want to get out of that brings you to a place of lust where you start to desire what can i do for these people to take them out of this Take them out of what? The great anger of the Lord? God was angry because they were disobedient and because they did not desire Him. This is the first commandment God gave them when they came out of Egypt. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength, your might, everything that you are. And these commands which I place upon you shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them completely to your children diligently. Show them how to love me with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. Show them how to do this so that when they sit at home, they'll talk about me. Hallelujah. When they're on the way, they'll talk about me. When they lie down in bed, they'll talk about me. When they rise up in the morning, they'll talk about me. And you're to bind this command as a sign upon your head, that upon your um, left arm. You know what that sign, that word sign is? That word sign is a monument. Oof. That word sign means to make a monument. Let it be bind upon your hand as a monument. Let my word be upon your heart as a monument as something that looks so big before you that every time you look at it, you will remember me. And he says, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. What? Even between your eyes when you look, you will see the word of God. And he says, and you shall, you shall write them upon the doorposts of your homes and the gates of your home. This is called the mezuzah. 
the doorpost. This is where God said to Moses, you are to strike the doorpost, the mezuzah with blood. And when I see the blood, I will pass over it. What are we to remember except that God brought us out of Egypt? The first commandment he gave them. And what do they do? They turn and they begin to complain against the savior of their souls. Have I conceived all these people, Moses said, that I brought, that I, that I, that I bring them forth, that I bring them forth. Watch it. Watch that eye. Watch that ego. It can grow very big. It can, it can make you proud. That you should say to me, bear them in your bosom like a nursing father carries the suckling child to the land which you swore to your forefathers. Wow. Watch it. This is the same Moses that when God told him in the desert to speak to the rock, he spoke, it to, he spoke to the rock once and water came out. The people desired water again and God said, strike, uh, speak to, excuse me, he spoke the first time and he told Moses, let me correct that. He spoke to Moses the first time, he said, strike the rock and he struck the rock and water came out. The second time that they desired water, he says, speak to the rock, but Moses struck it. And he said, how long shall I and Aaron give you water from this rock? What? It wasn't you in the first place that gave the water. Watch it. Watch that pride. From where should I get? Look what, he, look what Moses says. From where should I get flesh to give to all these people? What, what a language, right? Although we know he's talking about, you know, animals but look just you can just you could just smell you could just smell the defilement in this in this passage of scripture in verse 13 of, of numbers 11 for they weep to me saying give us flesh that we may eat oh man <laughs> come on give us the flesh pastor give us the flesh minister give us something that we can we can glean on don't leave us like this in the desert this is miserable here all we get is food from heaven Every day, supernaturally. No, give us, give us flesh, pastor. And that's the problem that we have to be careful. Remember, he was the shepherd of Israel. He was the lawgiver to bring them into the land. And what happens is that they became so accustomed to the, to the, ma to the, to the manner that they wanted their leader to give them flesh to eat. Oh man, was God angry with them. I'm not able to bear all these people alone. But God is merciful even to those who cry out because it is too heavy for me, he said. And you, watch this, and if you are going to part this way with me, I beg you to kill me at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and let me not see my misery. Wow. Yeah, it gets to the point where you could die. But look what God does. God tells God tells. Uh, Moses to gather 70 men, 70 elders among them so that they can be officers and so that they can be in the tabernacle and bring them to the tabernacle and let them stand there with you. He says, and I will talk with you there. In other words, God is going to show up there, Moses, and I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to take of your spirit and put it upon the 70 so that they have the burden and they you don't have to bear it alone. You know, and he said, tell the people to sanctify themselves tomorrow. You set themselves aside. Watch this. And you shall eat flesh. But you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore, God, the Lord, will give you flesh and you shall eat. Watch this. Day. And you shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, not even twenty. But how about a whole month until... It comes out of your nostrils, and it is hateful, detestable food to you, Israel, because you have despised the Lord among you and have wept before him, saying, why did we come out of Egypt? Oh, my Lord, what is wrong with us is that we despise the deliverance of the Lord. We despise the things that we brought us from. It becomes so common. It's, ah, you know what? We got to do this again and, and go to the church. And uh, Folks, be careful that we become complainers and we become lax. And everything that is holy becomes so common that it's, ah, so what? It's always here. Let's be grateful. The Bible says be grateful, be thankful. Now watch this. 
And so we know that Moses, the Lord spoke to Moses, and God tells him, has the Lord's hand become short? You shall see now whether or not my word shall come to pass. And when Moses went out and told the people what Jehovah said, and they gathered 70 men and God, you know, in the tabernacle and God, God's, you know, God's claim came down, God's glory came down in that cloud and he spoke to Moses and he put some of Moses' spirit upon them. Wow. And they were filled and they had the responsibility that even so much that there were two men from the 70 that were not there. There were 68 actually that showed up. Two men were not there and their name was Elad and Medad and the spirit rested upon them. And they, watch this, they also were prophesying in the camp. You see, God says, listen, I'm going to put it upon the people who are responsible, but watch what happens. Because what goes on here is very, very strategic how God puts the burden of Moses upon these men. And there was a young man that ran back and told Joshua, hey, these two guys in the camp, they're prophesying. They got the Spirit of God. And Joshua goes back and he tells Moses, tell, tell him to stop. And God said, don't, don't, you, don't you think that God wants all his, all his children to be prophets? And Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? Would God that all Jehovah's people were prophets, that Jehovah would put his spirit upon all of them? And so Moses went into the camp of the elders. Now here it comes, last part. And the wind went forth from Jehovah, and it cut off quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp about a day's journey on this side and about a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, and about two cubics high upon the face of the earth. That would be about 36 inches high. We say about a yard. I mean, there was so much quail coming that, wow, the people got up, man. Wow, yes, it's finally here. The flesh is here in the camp. I'm ready to eat. Let's go, children. Let's gather. And the people stood up all day and all night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails, and he gathered, watch this, and he that gathered least uh, gathered 10 homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. Let me tell you that word home is very, very strategic, what God did. It looked like mud. It was so it was so powerful that it looked like mud, the homer. And this was, homer is what they used to build materials for bricks. It was the same thing in Genesis with the Tower of Babel when they said, hey, let's go. It said, let us go and let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and, and slime had they for mortar. Listen, listen to what this Homer represents. It describes a people that opposes God. It, it describes symbolically of someone that is weak and, and defenseless. It was a surge, a heap of quail that came into the camp. And this is what it says in verse 33. And while the flesh was yet between their, their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of Jehovah was kindled against the people. And Jehovah struck the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Graves of Lust, because there they buried the people that lusted. And the people pulled up stakes and went from graves of lust to Hazaroth and stayed at Hazaroth, which means the place of settlement. God killed so many of his people there because they lusted after the flesh. And because of this, they had to pay the price. What price will you pay to have flesh in your mouth? What price will you pay so that you can have whatever you want what price will you pay to go out into the world and gather all that you can into your camp and find that your house has become a grave of lust and find that your children are growing up to be graves of lust and all that you have will be consumed and eventually you will pay the price. Even as people of God, we can pay the price. But God, but God is merciful. Remember, remember, what Isaiah said in 
chapter 57, that the righteous perish and no one ponders it in their heart, that they're taken away to be spared from evil. When God killed those people in the desert, he actually did them a favor. He actually showed his mercy. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy you so that you do not destroy others. I mean, think about this. Their children were going to grow up into this. Can you imagine all the people that died, all the quail that was in that, in that camp? I mean, it was a pollution. And then you wonder why the churches are weak, why churches are not moving in the will of God, why the world doesn't see the power of God in the church. It's because we have built for ourselves a camp full of quails and martyr and bricks for ourselves, and we have done things that are against the will of God. My Lord, have mercy upon us. I'm going to stop here. I pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord, Father, for you even said in Matthew, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. You preserved Jesus in that time when Joseph and Mary were afraid and you told them to go to Egypt. They went to Egypt, but then when those who wanted to kill the Son of God died, you said, go back now because you have something to do. And folks, God, God took you out of Egypt. He says, come out of that place now. I have something for you to do. Father, help us be merciful. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, have a beautiful and wonderful spirit-filled day. Get out of the graves of lust.